Ashbourne in County Meath was the venue of what was probably the most um, successful and well-known activities that the Irish Volunteers got involved in outside Dublin in the course of the Easter Rising. On Easter Monday, about 65 members of the Fingal Volunteers met up near Sword under the leadership of Thomas Ash. Apparently part of their plan was that they would hope to kind of extend their reach into the city to reach up or to link up with Daly's men in and around the four courts, but the small numbers involved meant that was never a realistic proposition. Now, they did pick up a number of stragglers, you might say, from uh, other units of the volunteers in the city, uh, most particularly Richard Mulcahy, who came to prominence in the events that happened in and around Ashbourne. Of the 65 volunteers who assembled, maybe only 45 remained active during the week, as the remainder were sent into the city to reinforce the volunteer positions within Dublin itself. And the purpose of these um, of the remaining 45 was essentially to move around North County Dublin and Meath in an attempt to kind of distract any British forces that might be in that vicinity and therefore draw them away from the city. Now uh, they all had bikes and kind of assembled themselves into these. Um, they broke the, they broke themselves down into I suppose units you might say um, or detachments. You know about say 10, 12 men apiece who would cycle around. They attacked various RIC barracks. They made attempts unsuccessfully to uh, disrupt some of the rail links leading north out of Dublin. Most of these would have been drawn from um, North Dublin's farming communities, and that could be seen in the weapons that they used. By far the most common weapon these men had for use, and the weapon for which they had the most ammunition for, were shotguns. They were farmers for the most part. Having camped overnight on Thursday night, on Friday morning they broke their camp with the intention of disrupting the Midlands Great Western Rail Line, running west out of Dublin, through Meath, out towards the west of the country. As they did so, they realised that to get to the rail line, they were going to have to go through Ashbourne, and they also realised that, well, the RIC barracks in Ashbourne still had members of the RIC in it, it had not surrendered. So at about 11.30, Ash and his men would have turned up in Ashbourne. Um, they demanded that the, or that the RIC men in the barracks surrender, they refused, and gunfire ensued for about 30 minutes until the RIC um, officers in the barracks decided to surrender. Now, not all of the 40 or so volunteers that are under Ash's command were involved in this. Given that they've been broken up into different detachments or units, uh, some of them had kind of stayed behind a little further back from their colleagues who were actually attacking the barracks. Around the time though that the barracks did surrender, RIC reinforcements arrived in Ashbourne. Perhaps as many as 24 cars with between 60 to 70 members of the RIC. They got out of their cars and a fairly intense gun battle ensued for the remainder of the afternoon. It only really ended at around 5pm. So from 11.30 to 5pm there was fighting in and around this RIC barracks in Ashbourne. The significance of Ashbourne, even aside from the fact that ultimately the volunteers got the upper hand and the RIC men they were fighting surrendered, lies in the manner of the fighting. It was a guerrilla warfare. Um, under Richard Mulcahy and Ash, they basically managed to kind of outmaneuver their RIC opponents. They could see where these RIC men had parked their cars on the road and where they were positioned on the main road leading into Ashbourne. And members of the volunteers under Mulcahy and Ash were able to kind of, you might say, outflank or outmaneuver them. And at around five o'clock after they killed the an RIC inspector called Harry Smith, um, the remainder of the RIC officers involved would have surrendered. About perhaps two members of the Irish Volunteers were killed, and estimates of the RIC dead at the time went from between 8 to 11. This was really the end, or the high point, of the campaign we led by Asham Mulcahy in North Dublin. Both of them would have surrendered at that weekend, as the rising in Dublin would have collapsed. But the events at Ashbourne are, sim are sometimes... Um, it's sometimes suggested that they were a precursor to the kind of uh, conflict that the IRA later fought in the War of Independence, the war to flee, the use of flying columns and ambushes, most especially as directed against the RIC. Um, I suppose that view is influenced by the fact that Richard Mulcahy, who was detained and imprisoned after um, the Easter Rising, later ended up as the Chief of Staff of the Irish Volunteers during the War of Independence. As for Thomas Ashe, who I suppose is the individual most associated with the events at Ashbourne, he too was, he was sentenced to death, was imprisoned, was released, um, but was imprisoned again after making a seditious speech in Longford in 1917 and subsequently died while being force-fed on hunger strike.